So today we are going to be applying what we have been learning about reading the Bible by getting back into God's word together. Hmm? You can't hear? I can hear. Perfect. <laughs> so we are going to be back in Matthew, picking up where we left off. Uh, picking up where we left off, we're going to be in Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22. If you don't have a note sheet, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Kiki and Cameron are going down the aisles, passing those out. Remember to grab those when you come into the room. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. So open your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. But we're actually going to start back in verse 1. I'm going to help you guys remember how we got here. Does everyone have a note sheet? Okay. I want to give you anticipation about where today's message is going to end. That song that we just sang, my one defense, my righteousness, my God, how I need you. I'm going to give you the punchline of the sermon. By the end of today, I pray that that is your cry, that that's your plea to the Lord. On the way there, Let's look at the text to understand what Jesus is saying in these verses where we're going to focus. Do you remember back in Matthew 5? We're in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus on a mountain with his followers teaching them. Do you remember how he started those first 12 verses or so called the Beatitudes? We spent quite a few weeks on those. Do you remember it said, Every one of those said, blessed are. And, and it, Jesus described the true citizens of the kingdom of heaven. He described God's children. And he said that they're truly blessed, especially when they're suffering now. Like how often would you go through life and when you were persecuted, when you were poor, when you were hungry, in conflict, would you say, oh yeah, I'm truly blessed. Jesus said that for those who are citizens of heaven, for those who've been adopted as God's children, especially in trial here in this world, they are truly blessed. It's a different standard of judging blessedness than what we'd naturally think. <laughs> hey Jude, can you hit can you hit mute on your uh, on your side? Unless you have a question, and then you can you can unmute it and raise your hand. Perfect. <laughs> so think about it. This isn't just words on a page. This is truth. Do you believe Jesus when he says that you're blessed? when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. Or blessed are the peacemakers. Think about that. That means that you're in conflict. And in that conflict, you have to make peace. He says, you're, you're blessed because you're a child of God. Look at verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you know that when Luke is talking about this, he actually says not only did Jesus say, rejoice and be glad, Jesus says, in, in Luke, he says, leap for joy. Is that your natural response when people persecute you or speak evil falsely against you? It's not mine. 
It's not my natural response. But that's Jesus' point. These are not natural people who are going to respond like this. These are people who are living not for this world, but for which world? Which kingdom? Heavenly kingdom. They're not like the way that you were when you were born. You are. These are people who've been changed, who've been adopted as Christ's children and transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. What's your natural response when people sin against you? This is a, a real question. What's your natural response when somebody sins against you? Yeah. Anger. I think that's right. Anger is my natural response when someone sins against me. Jesus doesn't say, be angry. He says, rejoice. Uh, leap for joy. Be glad because your reward is great in heaven. In that relationship, don't get back at them. Don't get angry. Be a peacemaker because that's what children of God do. And then he goes on in verse 12. The reason why I'm doing this is to catch us up because we're going to plop down in the middle. And remember how we talked about when we read God's word? We have to ask those who, what, when, where, why, how questions. And so one of the things that you do is you back up. You get a running start at the verse. And I want to make sure that we're doing that. Remind us of what we're, we're going to drop into. Do you remember I taught you on salt and light? What That Jesus describes people who are living for the kingdom of heaven like salt and like light. Does anybody remember how salt and light are, are related? And why Jesus would say that his followers are like salt and light in the world? David? Yeah, they stand out. That's good. They stand out from the world. Like if you put salt in your soup, you can taste it, right? You can usually taste salt. And if you put salt in your soup that's not salty, is that salt worth anything? No. You remember that? Because it's, it's not doing its job. God saved people to be salty in the world, to be different, to stand out, to do good works so that people glorify their Father our Father in heaven. And what about light? Light stands out. Have you ever had like a, I have a super annoying light in our in our bedroom. I have a, a, a piece of tape over it. It's a, just one of those blue lights in the corner. Have you, do you, any of you guys have that? It's just, it's so annoying, right? It's dark in the room and there's one little light in the corner and it feels like in the middle of the night when it's at its darkest, like that light lights up the whole room and it's all that you can see. That's the way a Christian should be in a dark room in a world. It's like, oh man, that person stands out. And it's not because they're trying to stand out. It's because they've been changed. Their very nature has been changed. You've been taken from darkness to light. You're not living for this world anymore when you're a Christian. You're living for heaven. You're living for God. You're trying to please God. and He's changed that person from the heart. And so when they're in the dark world, they're going to shine like lights. So look down at verse 16. Let your light shine before others. He's speaking to Christians. So that they, the darkness, the world, may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So he's speaking to those who've been made God's children. And saying, God made you to be light. Be light. And then Jesus goes on. And he said that, Therefore, citizens of heaven, God's children, are truly righteous. How do you become a child of God? How do you get transferred from that domain of darkness to the kingdom of Christ? How, how are you saved? Who has an answer for that question? That's a pretty important question. How is somebody saved? How does this actually happen? Ellie. Through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through faith and God adopts you. Is it because of your works? Because if you do enough, what, what's the, it's by grace through faith. 
not of your works. Right. Yeah, but when God, when God saves you, he actually changes you from the heart. He forgives you all of your sins, and he changes you from the heart. Have you ever thought, well, if God forgives me of all of my sins, maybe it doesn't matter whether I obey. Have you ever thought that? Raise your hand if you've thought that. I, I personally, when I'm facing temptation, my flesh will argue with me. He'll say, God will forgive you anyway. Why does it matter if you sin? That's a lie. That is not why God saved you. If you're saved, God does forgive all of your sins but he doesn't forgive your sins so that you can sin. And that's why Jesus goes on to say, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. Who's he talking to here? There's this group of people. Have you heard of the scribes and the Pharisees? I, most of you guys probably have. So there are these people, and they were teaching Israel. The scribes and the Pharisees were the religious leaders in, uh, in Israel. The, the scribes were the ones who copied down the law, right? There weren't printing presses. There weren't lots of books. It was, took a lot of work to get a copy of a book. But thankfully, the scribes, they would copy God's word, and they would study it, and they would know it. Pharisees, they memorized a lot of it, and they would teach it to the people. These people, a lot of them, they didn't know how to read, or even if they knew how to read, they didn't have their own copy of God's word in their hand. And so a lot of the audience in this time was dependent on what they heard from the scribes and the Pharisees. And that was a little bit unfortunate because the scribes and the Pharisees didn't always just read God's word to them but they told them what it meant. But they didn't actually tell them what it meant. They told them their interpretation of what it meant. So in the Old Testament, we're talking to Israel. Do you know how many times a year they were supposed to fast? The answer is one. Just one time on the Day of Atonement, Israel was supposed to fast. Do you know how many times a week the Pharisees fasted? <laughs> Twice, twice every week. So they said, all right, if we're supposed to fast once, let's raise that bar. We're going to fast twice every week. And then do you know what? The, the Bible said, or the Old Testament said, you're supposed to give 10% of everything. And so they went down and they measured when they got a what, dill and cumin, just two tiny little spices. If they, they got a, a gram of cumin, they said 0.9 grams, 0.9 grams for me, 0.1 grams for God. And they, they were so focusing on everything. And they told the people, this is the standard of holiness. You have to go down to the very detail of keeping the law. But do you know what they didn't do? What, what's the two most important laws? You guys heard Jesus asked, he said, what, what's the two most important laws or what's the yes what's the most two yep love love god with all your heart what's the second it's like it yeah love your neighbor as yourself so that's x <laughs> that's deuteronomy 6 and leviticus 19 love love your god with all your heart love your neighbor as yourself you know which which uh laws the pharisees and the uh scribes didn't focus on those two, right? They wanted this, they focused on the external. And when Jesus came and said, hey, you guys are putting the emphasis in the wrong place. You're, you're focusing on these external things and you're making up rules that aren't even in the law. Uh, no, you, you don't come to God by, by law keeping. Law, God didn't give you the law to make you holy. You're never going to keep it perfectly. And you also, God gave you the law to teach you that you actually have to fear God from the heart. 
you have to love him from the heart. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. But the Pharisees and the scribes, and then the Jewish people were taught to be like this. They said, well, you know what the true measure of righteousness is? They said, well, it's, it's how well I keep all this out, outward external stuff. And Jesus came and was saying, well, no, it's this internal stuff that matters, and I'm not keeping your made-up rules. Jesus said, I'm, we, we're not going to fast twice a week. The Bible doesn't say to do that. Jesus kept God's actual law, not the made-up law. And Jesus revealed that the law actually focused for Israel. It always did on the internal, on the heart. So the scribes and the Pharisees, though, they would say, Jesus, you're not keeping our rules. You're not keeping our version of the law that we're telling all the people. And so they would tell Jesus, they would tell the people, Jesus is coming to get rid of the law. Jesus is coming to minimize the law, make it less important, less stringent on people. Jesus has a lower standard of holiness. Jesus doesn't live up to our standard. And that's what Jesus was talking against in 17 through 20. Jesus said, if whoever relaxes even the least, in verse 19, of one of the commandments in the Old Testament, in the Law and the Prophets, and if he teaches others to do the same, that one will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, these two groups of people that the Israelites were taught to think, or Israel was taught to think, okay, this is the pinnacle of, whole, of righteousness. The scribes and the Pharisees, they keep all these rules that aren't even in the Bible. They're so righteous. Jesus said, unless your righteousness is more than that person, You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you see, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't use the law rightly. You know what? They, they looked at the law and they thought they would be justified by keeping it. Who knows what justified means? What do you got? To be declared not guilty, to be declared righteous. Yeah, to be declared righteous, not guilty. So what they said was they, the Pharisees, the scribes, a lot of Jewish leaders, and you know what? You might act this way too. I want you to look inside of yourself and see if there's any hint of this law justifying heart inside of you. They looked at the law and they said, I can do that. And if I can't, I'm just going to twist it in my own mind, in my own interpretation, so that I, I measure up okay. And so they looked at the law and thought, I'm going to be justified by keeping it. And then when they saw somebody who kept it less well than them, they looked at that person and said, I'm better than them. They judged them. But what Jesus actually exposes is that they didn't go far enough in their keeping of the law. The Pharisees thought the law was a big deal. It was everything to them. But Jesus shows them that you're only truly righteous in Christ. That even the scribes and the Pharisees weren't righteous enough to get to heaven. They could not be justified by works of the law. In fact, nobody can be justified by works of the law ever. And Jesus says that's not a reason to make the law, to make the rules less stringent. Well, I can't, I can't get to heaven by keeping the law. So my heart, when I'm tempted, sometimes says, don't worry about keeping it. Jesus actually says the exact opposite. He says, you can't get to heaven by keeping the law. Let me tell you how stringent and hard to keep God's law actually is. And now we get to today's message. Uh, verse 21. So what we have, go to the next slide. 
we have Jesus calls his brothers, those are those who've been saved, true Christians, by faith, who've been adopted by their father. He calls his brothers to a heart-level standard of righteousness. And he reveals that if you don't have that heart-level standard of righteousness in you, uh, he reveals what judgment you're going to have. So let's read it together. It says, starting in verse 21, You have heard it said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. All right, so let's look at the first point. Jesus says that to the external, externally focused religious people, Jesus says, if you don't, or the, sorry, the externally focused religious people say, well, if I don't murder, I won't be judged. And you're like, where is that in the text? Well, let me show you. Because uh, that's it, the externally focused religious. Who, who are those people? Who do you think I'm referring to? Scribes, Pharisees, and maybe you. Maybe you. Externally focused religious people think, well, as long as I don't murder, maybe I'm okay. I won't be judged. I'm not as bad as the people who do murder. Why do I say that? Well, let's zoom out and look at the big picture of this section. Do you see how Jesus, he said, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he moves to this next section. And so when we study the Bible, one of the really helpful things to do is to look for repeated things. When you look for repeated words, repeated sentence structures, it helps you understand what was in the mind of the author. And remember, that's our main goal in interpretation. What was the original author's intent? To the original people. And that's what we have here. We have Jesus preaching a sermon. And look what he says. He, he repeats, verse 21, you have heard that it was said. And then he quotes a teaching from, this, from the religious teachers, usually quoting the Old Testament, but not always. And then he said, verse 27, you have heard that it was said. You have it repeated again. Verse 31, you have heard it said, whoever divorces his wife. 33, you have heard it said. 38, 43. You see how Jesus is, is countering the view of the people that, oh, the, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, if anybody gets into heaven, it's them. And Jesus says, nope, that's not righteous enough. They say this, but I say to you, and he tells them their, his teaching. So when we look at that, we say, all right, this is, uh, Jesus is setting the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees against the true teaching of God's word that he's going to now teach with authority. So he said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Who knows where that is in the Bible? So saying you've heard it said to those of old, so long time ago, in the olden days, and this is what they'd go to synagogue and they'd hear about, okay, Moses taught, don't murder. Anyone know where that is in the Old Testament? Anybody memorize Ten Commandments? Exodus 20, good job. And this is, I'm going to ask you this not as, and you're going to be like, why do you keep doing this? It is really helpful when you're studying the Bible to make this mental map of God's word. Okay, that's where it talks about. It talks about murder in Genesis 9. Well, we have, right, first murder. You have Cain killing Abel, right? And then you have Genesis 9. If you murder, you're going to be, your lifeblood is going to be required of you because you murder somebody in the image of God. And then you have Exodus 20, and you, have, and you could go through. It's really helpful when you're studying God's word to make this mental map, where does the Bible talk about 
whatever you're studying. You know what? It might be really hard at your age. You might just have two spots. You might say, all right, murder. I got Exodus 20, and Matthew 5. And then next year, you add another one. And then next year you add another one. And next year you add another one. And then by the time you're my age, you might have a few more. And if you do that for lots and lots of things in the Bible, you're going to be in a better position to understand not just one verse, but all of Scripture. And you can't do that all at once. You have to do that bit by bit, day after day. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about what those people had heard said. Do not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Do you know that that part isn't in the Old Testament? It just says in, in the Ten Commandments, it says, I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of Egypt. And then he gives the Ten Commandments. Don't murder. It is true that in the Old Testament, God set up systems of judgment for Israel where if you murder, you will actually face the death penalty. And he put judicial systems in place where that would all happen. But the heart of the command was you've sinned against God, even back in Genesis 9 after the flood. And God, one of the commands that God says is, if you murder, you're going to actually face death. But the emphasis was because you've sinned against me, Yahweh. And how have the religious teachers here pared this message down? Well, if you, if you sin, if you murder, there's going, to be, there's going to be judgment. And you know what judgment they were talking about? Not God. They were talking about, well, we're the religious leaders. We have court systems. We're going to render a judgment. And I'll get in in the next weeks, show you how that's what was on their mind the religious leaders, in every one of these times as they go through each of these statements that Jesus is saying. But the religious leaders, they were focusing on the outside. They said, well, if, if there's a murderer, he's going to face judgment. And the religious leaders were like, and I'm not a murderer, so I am free from judgment. Have you ever thought that when you see somebody, you, you watch the news and you think, oh man, what a wicked person. That person murdered somebody. They're so evil, I would never do such a thing. And you actually feel a little bit self-justified, a little bit better, because no matter how bad you are, you're not as bad as that person. And you know, even that person could come up with, well, I murdered somebody for a good reason. I'm not as bad as, and you could point to somebody else. And God shows here that his standard is so much higher. So you see that the externally focused religious, the scribes, the Pharisees, maybe you and me, they missed the point. In the law, God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't hate your neighbor. It actually says in the verse right before, and if you want to look that up later, that's Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. Don't hate your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you think of that, that command, that loving your neighbor is about as far as you can get from murder. And so the scribes and the Pharisees missed this point, and they misapplied the law in a way that made them feel good about themselves and superior to those around them, while they completely lacked love for God and true love for their neighbor. They didn't care about their neighbor at all. They just wanted th their neighbors, in their mind, the neighbor's importance was so that they could see how righteous they were and be impressed. Jesus actually gives a, a story about a Pharisee. He and a, a poor man are, are praying, a tax collector are praying, and the, the Pharisee looks over at the tax collector and says, oh, thank you, God, that I'm not like this guy, a sinner. He looked at the law that he wasn't keeping because he wasn't loving his neighbor. He wasn't aware of how far short of the law he had fallen. 
but he felt pretty good about himself. I promise you, if you read God's word and you walk away feeling better about yourself based on your own performance and how well you do better than your friends, better than the people at school, better than the people in the world, you are reading the Bible wrong. You don't go to the Bible to get a high self-esteem. Jesus said, you've heard it said this way, but I say to you, next slide, but I say to you, and then he reveals that God is focused on the heart and that anger earns us God's judgment. Jesus gets right past this external and says, I don't care if you haven't murdered anybody. You want me to tell you the standard that God measures by for righteousness? He says, but they say this, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Let's break this verse down. Jesus starts, he goes, but I say. Jesus taught with authority. That was the conclusion at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So in, in Matthew 7, the conclusion from the crowds were, oh, this guy doesn't teach like our scribes like our like the normal religious leaders this man teaches with authority this was the word of god incarnate teaching what the word of god actually meant he wasn't actually even saying anything that wasn't already encapsulated in the law that the pharisees were trying to hold themselves saying they were holding themselves to jesus says let me explain what the word of God and God's word actually demands when it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Let me actually tell you what your father in heaven demands. And that should be critical for you. If you're living for your father in heaven and you want what he wants, you should read this and say, okay, this is a really big deal. Anger earns judgment because Jesus said it and it's not just murderers who will be liable to judgment but everyone look at the symmetry in 21 and 22 remember we look at our fish we we, we look at the text we look for, for things like this for symmetry for repeated words repeated sentences you see that here you've heard it said whoever murders will be liable to judgment but I say Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Do you see the repeated phrase? Jesus is correlating uh, murder and anger with his brother. The root of murder is anger. Anger is murderous in principle. Thus the Lord, the righteous judge, to the Lord, the righteous judge, the one who he actually sees what really matters when he sees you angry. It's right that judgment is the result. But remember, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they weren't even primarily interested in, if you murder, God will judge you. They say, nope, if you murder, there's going to be horizontal consequences, consequences with people. And Jesus actually, as we'll see, he goes on and, and just clarifies, it's not merely horizontal, horizontal consequences, consequences with people when you hate. It's not only that you ought to be judged by people, but it's that you're going to be found liable to God himself. We're going to get there. But then Jesus says, whoever's angry, we're paying attention to every word with his brother. That word, with his brother, it points back just a few verses. Do you remember where in verse uh, 19, uh, where does he say Father in heaven? Uh, 16, thank you, Cameron. Verse 16, 
Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Jesus is all along here. Remember, blessed are, peace, are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. He's, your good works give glory to your Father in heaven. And your anger, who's it against? Other people who've been forgiven, just like you, adopted by grace, made part of the family of God. Jesus was reminding us of God's adopting love for us. So John, you know, the Apostle John, he was there this day. I think he probably had this in mind when he wrote 1 John 3.14. I'm going to read it to you. Close your eyes and listen. Hear echoes of what Jesus was teaching here. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Now here's where I really want you to focus. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Do you hear this word from Jesus? If you hate your brother, and that's not limited to your biological brother. It's if you hate another Christian. And I don't think Jesus is even limiting it just to other Christians, but he's reminding you of your relationship to God the Father. If you have anger in you, God's love does not abide in you. And that means eternal life does not abide in you. Jesus was agreeing with the Pharisees that murder makes you liable to judgment. But so does anger. This word anger here, it's a sin for man. The, the Greek word is orge. Just so you know that the Greek word, because I'm going to use it later. If you, if you search the Bible, every time where that word is used, when it describes people, it's sinful. But do you know who else this word, orge, or the, the orge is the noun, or gizo is the, the, the verb, do you know who else that word is paired with where it's not sin? There's only one person for whom this is right, and it's God. In uh, Romans 12, 18 and 19, do you know what it says? It says, repay no one evil for evil. And as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself but leave it to the, Smed mentioned this verse this morning, leave it to the orge of God. Leave it to the wrath of God. Same word. It's wrong for us to have anger. It's right for God. Because God is the righteous judge. He's the one who we've sinned against. You know what you're saying when you're mad at your neighbor, when you're mad at your brother, when you're angry with your brother? You're saying, I want to take the position of God, the judge right now. I want to judge you. And you're judging them in your heart with anger. And there's so many other passages that teach about anger taking the place of being a judge. If you want to look them up, or if you're listening to this at home, uh, you could look up James 4, 11 through 12. James 1, 19. But ultimately, I think it's helpful. This word appears again in Matthew 18, in the parable of the unforgiving servant. 
Smedley, if you were there this morning, did a great job of teaching it. Remember the, the guy who had 10,000 lifetimes of debt forgiven him. Every Christian, every child of God is in that position. You've had so much debt forgiven, so much sin forgiven, that you never could have paid it off. And when somebody sins against you and you go to them and you say, pay me what I owe, or pay me what you owe, you're acting like you weren't forgiven all that debt. And that's why Jesus says, brother here, that's why Jesus reminds you, don't you, don't you remember you're part of this family and it's been by grace. Remember what you've been forgiven. What, does, what are you saying when you're angry with your brother? The guy with $10 trillion worth of debt forgiven goes out and says to the guy who owes him 8000 bucks, pay me what you owe. And do you know where that word orge appears in that parable? Verse 34. And in anger, in orge, his master, God, turned, delivered that unforgiving servant over to the jailers until he should pay all of his debts. It's wrong for us to be in the position of judge, especially when we've been forgiven so much. You would never want God to hold you to the standard of saying, God, give me what I'm owed. If you went to God and said that, what would you get? Hell of fire. Judgment liability and when you're angry with somebody else you're saying you sinned against me i want to give you what you're owed that at the heart of it is what leads to murder that at the heart of it is what anger is in these next two words we're gonna we're almost done Jesus says, whoever insults his brother, that's literally whoever says raka to his brother. None of you have said raka to your brother. Raka is, is an Aramaic term that, that just means you fool, you blockhead, you idiot. And he says, whoever says you fool, I think those are about the same, the same phrase. This person, he says, will be liable to the Sanhedrin. Will be liable, if you say it out loud, if you say you fool, the same people that should judge you if, you're, if you murder, you're breaking the law, you should be liable to them. But you know what? If you say you fool, ultimately you're liable to God. And it is not an overreaction to pay you for what you're owed in hell. This is really sobering. Sometimes I don't even realize I'm angry. I'm angry. Have you ever, do you ever roll your eyes when something doesn't go your way? Somebody says something you don't like that doesn't feel like it's right, and you're just like, oh, you idiot. So stupid. You mutter it under your breath. Maybe you say it out loud. Maybe you say it in your heart. Do you realize what that actually means is going on in your heart? And what you are actually owed for that response. Now, you see why I said at the beginning of this, the, the song that Chris led us in, I need you, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness my God, how I need you. If your righteousness, if you must be righteous to enter the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness has to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. You actually have to be as righteous as Jesus to get in. And then if this is the standard, not only don't murder, but don't say, oh, idiot, fool, fool, 
can't even roll your eyes. How can anybody meet the standard? How can anybody get to heaven? Do we just despair and say, well, I don't have to follow the laws. I can't do it anyway, so why try? No. But you also can't say, maybe I just need to try harder. If I try harder at not being angry, maybe I'll do better next time. That won't last very long. Jesus in the gospel frees you from both sin's penalty, he saves you from hell, because he took that hell of fire on himself on the cross. Every ounce of God's righteous orge against you, his righteous wrath against you, Jesus absorbed at the cross if you would turn to him in faith. None remains. See how that puts you in a position to look at others when they sin against you? Rejoice. Leap for joy. Be glad. Not because they're mistreating you, but because you have great treasure in heaven. Do you think you'll care about that insult in 110,000 years? What about in a million years? 10 million years. You're going to look back. You're going to say, that wasn't so bad. That was just a slight and momentary affliction that was preparing me for this eternal weight of glory. Oh, what a big deal it is to be called God's child. He took my wrath. So in the gospel, Jesus frees you from sin's penalty. And he changes you from the heart and frees you from sin's power. You know what? One day, when you're in heaven, you won't be able to sin. He will totally get rid of that. Uh, sin nature that's in you. And you won't even be tempted to respond to your brother, you fool. But for now, he actually, if you will turn to him in faith, he gives you the power from the heart to obey this. You have a chance now to obey. And when you don't, it says in 1 John 2, if you sin, you have an advocate with Father, with the Father, with your judge. Who's your advocate? Do you guys remember what it says? Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You have to have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus, who said the laws, is this hard? He fulfilled the law, and he is your righteousness, the righteousness for all. Who would trust in him. So let's pray and let's go to discussion groups and uh, talk, about, talk about the lesson and the glorious gospel as our only solution. God, thank you for your word, for this high standard that makes us give up of ever meeting your standard on, on our own. We need Jesus, who is never unrighteously angry, who met every standard of the law and absorbed your wrath for every one of us who fall so far short. God, I pray for our discussion groups that we would be honest with one another, care for one another, that your word would impact us. I even pray that some would be saved today, that they would realize just how far short of your law they fall and how religion and effort could never get us to you. We need you. We need a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.